Okay, um, welcome everyone. It's lovely to have you with us tonight. Uh, my name is Sally Thurston from the Maynard Public Library. Um, and once again, David has uh, agreed to do another local history talk for us. And we are joined by um, the Maynard Community Gardeners and Aaron Webb is with us from, from the MCG. Um, so Aaron, do you want to talk about one of your programs coming up? Yeah, definitely. Um, so in addition to tonight's talk, which we're really excited about, um, I will be hosting um, a little get together on Saturday, April 2nd, at 10 a.m. at the Ice House Landing. Uh, we're gonna talk um, it's a haiku workshop and nature walk. I'm going to uh, lecture a little bit. We're gonna talk a little bit about the history and the conventions and the practice of haiku and how haiku can um, enrich and enliven our uh, appreciation of nature. It's nice to be able to do that. Um, before the full bloom of spring. Um, and then we're gonna have a little bit of a nature walk in which we sort of take, take nature in and, and let those creative juices stir. So if anybody's interested in that, um, you can contact me or Sally with any questions that you have. And to register for that, you just go to the Maynard Library uh, website, the Maynard Library website. All right, thank yeah, and, you. And I'll put, the, I'll put the registration link in the chat. Great. Um, we have another, program coming up on uh, two weeks from tonight on the 31st. Um, Dimitra Sakaris, I'm not sure I'm getting that right. Um, she can jump in and correct me. <laughs> um, she is a landscaper and she's gonna do a talk about um, gardening through climate change. Um, so strategies to make your garden hardy and sustainable. Um, so I think that'll be interesting. Um, that I'll also put the link to that in the chat um, in just a minute. Um, so for those of you who have been to David's talks before, uh, feel free to um, put your questions in the chat and then he, he will have a Q&A session at the end. Um, if you prefer to hold your question and ask in person at the end, that's perfectly fine too. Um, and um, we do have transcription turned on. So if you'd like to see a transcription of the talk, um, there's a button at the bottom that says, uh, I think it's transcription. <laughs> mine, has, mine has gone, of course. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, there is transcription available. Um, so let's get started. Um, this is David's, we were just talking, this is David's 12th talk in the last year. Um, so that's been a, it's been a great boon for history buffs and uh, all of us in Maynard. Um, since 2009, David's been a contributor to the Beacon Villager with his column, Life Outdoors. Um, with the column covers a broad range of topics, including local history, outdoor recreation, natural history, and um, things like the Maynard family and local businesses and anything you could possibly want to know about Maynard. <laughs> um, and those columns have been collected into, into two books, uh, Maynard History and Life Outdoors and Hidden History of Maynard. Uh, David is the driving force behind the Trail of Flowers, which he'll be talking about later. And he was also a member of the Sesquicentennial Steering Committee that published the 150th History of Maynard. Uh, we have copies of that book at the library and they're also, are they still at Six Bridges Gallery, David? Yes. Okay. So if you'd like one of those books, stop by. Um, and with no further ado, um, we'll turn it over to David. Welcome and thank you. Okay, a pleasure and happy to see everyone. I do want to have that plug for uh, Maynard, Massachusetts, uh, the 150th anniversary. Uh, we have limited numbers of copies still available, but they are at Six Bridges Gallery and at the library for $22 a book. Okay, and that said, I'm now going to move to the slideshow and we will uh, go for it. All right, first, great. can people see this? Everyone, can we, okay, we got some yep. nods and everyone can hear me. All good. So what we're looking at is 150 years of trees and gardens um, in Maynard, uh, pretty much to, to match Maynard's history as Maynard. Uh, our host is uh, Maynard Community Gardeners, uh, produced by the Maynard Public Library. A lot of this information, uh, especially the pictures, come to us from the Maynard Historical Society collection. And if someone feels really necessary to send me an email telling me I got something wrong, there's my email address. Or if you wanna tell me I got something right, that works too. 
so we talk about how Maynard's tree population has changed over time. Uh, it's a period of deforestation and reforestation. Uh, we've lost species due to disease and basic insects. There have been definitely in introductions of new tree species. The picture you're looking at is a European copper beech at 80 Acton Street. This may very well be the largest tree in Maynard. It has a girth of 21 feet. Um, and uh, European copper beaches weren't even brought over to the US around 1820, but this one most likely dates to when the house was built, which is a little bit later than that. Another major change we have to understand is the 1938 hurricane came through and damaged tremendous numbers of trees all across our area of New England. Uh, Management had changed from the very beginning. We had surveyors of lumber, um, also uh, managers of, of uh, wood and bark, managing the sales and the quality of that. We've had a lot of loss of street trees downtown and elsewhere, often because streets were initially um, dirt and as they became wider, the trees got sort of squished between the paved street and the sidewalk um, to try to help sort of resurrect uh, tree, urban trees. The tree committee um, has, was formed in, in 2020. So we talk about trees we've lost. I mean, we sort of know we're the American chestnut, but then um, we've had the, um, was it the gypsy moth is a multi-species oak with a lot of others. And then the brown tail moth, another generalist definitely likes oak and others. Um, we've lost elms to a fungus. We've lost according to a bittersweet reached here and it's sort of a tree crushing vine kills trees by its weight sunlight competition. Um, the American dogwood uh, lost to again a, a fungus and we're losing our hemlocks now to the hemlock woolly albigid. Um, Multi-species, I don't know if you lot of remember, but late 20th century, early 21st, we had a lot of damage around here by winter moths, uh, which has since diminished because some predator species, some parasite predator species have been brought in. And we're beginning to lose the, our ash trees. Uh, to get back to what we're talking about, we're talking about uh, deforestation and reforestation. I'm actually going to back this up a bit. I want to point out that in the early colonial era, and I don't have a picture for this, so you're going to have to listen to my words. The land that would become Massachusetts was an estimated 90% tree covered. So you have to imagine, except for marshes and, and, and swamps and, and beaver ponds and a few barren mountaintops, uh, the colonial Massachusetts was 90% tree covered. Cutting down of trees for farming, for firewood, for fencing, reduces to a low of 30% circa 1875. So just about when Maine was being formed, this was the low in the total number of trees covering land in Massachusetts. And this does not mean that there was 30% virgin forest. You have to realize that re really nearly all had been cut. Some reforested after poor farmland was abandoned. Some maintained as firewood lots where you're going back and cutting every year, trying to trim to cut away your fire by letting trees grow up. Um, circa 1875, we have a change. Heating and cooking and railroads were converted to coal. Lumber for construction was brought in by train uh, from Maine, from Michigan. Massive farm abandonment, and this is the most important thing, all across New England. Massive farm and, and uh, abandonment for people who said, I'm tired of this, I'm moving to Ohio where it's flat. I can run a plow, I can run a uh, horse-drawn reaper led to a reforestation that actually peaked at 70% around 1960. So this area had gone from 90% trees down to 30, back up to 70. Now from then to the present, there has been a gradual deforestation to about 60%, the consequence of population increases, growth of suburbia, but going forward, state and local efforts need to be made to sustain tree cover. Uh, okay, so Oriental Bittersweet, we've got a picture over here of uh, an avid volunteer up on Summer Hill and all those twisty things he's cutting are Oriental Bittersweet vines that were 10, 15, 20, 25 years old, two, three, four inches in diameter, and just pulling down trees with their weight. And then you can see also a wreath made of the vines with the berries, which is of course very pretty. Uh, but what happens is the robins come and eat these in the spring, and then they poop out the seeds. And that's why you see a lot of uh, woodland edges uh, with a little bit more sunshine, 
where the robins tend to, to roost uh, is, is where you see the worst propagation of um, bittersweet. Then we had moth problems. Now we have to realize that, you know, circa 1900, 1905, 1910, Maynard actually had a moth department to remove gypsy moth egg cases and clip branches that have brown tail moth webs. So the pictures you see on the right are a male with the darker brown and a female with the white wings. And the lower picture is the females laying these fuzzy egg cases in the trunks of the trees. So one of the things that's important is the females do not fly, even though they have wings. They are, they are climbing up from the ground and laying these egg cases. So you are trying to maintain trees by just scraping these off, or you can actually put sticky stuff around the trunk that it gets stuck in. Uh, the, what you see with the horse and the wagon, the guys, they had a spray can, but also long poles because brown town moths, uh, let's see, we have pictures of them. Okay, now you know why it's called a brown town moth. Here's the problem. Not only were these tree killers, and you can see what the webbed nests look like in the, the blue picture on the lower right. Uh, they sort of overwinter as, as caterpillars in these and then come out in the spring and eat everything. Um, but the barbed hairs that are on the moths and also on the caterpillars contain chemical compounds that cause a poison ivy-like rash. And they shed these hairs and the hairs remain toxic. So you could be out playing, um, sitting outside of the picnic table, uh, raking leaves and raking these up and getting um, a skin rash on your neck, on your hands, uh, irritated eyes, uh, as asthma-like attacks from these brown tail moths. Um, these are gone from here now. Some of the parasites brought in to combat gypsy moths were actually much more effective affecting brown tail moths, but there is a significant brown tail moth problem resurging um, in central and northern Maine, uh, north of Portland. So if you, but you have to remember they were as far down here and horrifically bad um, to the point that the budget for the brown tail for the moth department was larger than the budget for the fire or police. Now, if we talk about more recent, I don't know if any of you remember um, seeing winter moths and they're so cold because they don't really come out of the pupa until after Thanksgiving and you see them flying around even though it's snowing and cold. This is because they basically are synthesizing antifreeze. So they are, they are frost and, and freezing resistant. Again, the females, the picture on the lower left is a female with just vestigial wings, a fairly large body. The one on the upper left, a male, about the size of a nickel. So the females walk over the trees and climb up the trunks. And that's what you see going on in that birch tree in the center. So if you wrap saran wrap around a tree, as I've done on the right, and then coat it with stuff called tree tanglefoot, it's sticky and stays sticky. The females walking up will get stuck in it. And the males are attracted to the pheromones and they get stuck in it and you're protecting your trees. Otherwise, these are decimating maple trees. You can see up the upper right corner of the chewed up leaves of maple, but they'll also eat um, like blueberry flowers before the flowers can form. So you're losing your blueberry crop. Um, any other sort of little flower buds, they're very early eating these flower buds. So this, this was a real problem with uh, damage to, uh, I'll just make sure I'm covering everything. Um, you know, the, the moth problems, but right now the winter moth is, is in receding because there's a parasitic watch, excuse me, wasp and a parasitic fly that are combating successfully um, the, um, this invasive species uh, from Europe. If we talked about introduced tree species, well, some of these you recognize very easily. Apple, pear, peach. Um, uh, some of the ones we don't like anymore, uh, Tree of Heaven, uh, Norway Maple, uh, Black Locust, Buckthorn are considered invasive in Massachusetts. So we, we really shouldn't be planting these. There's actually so many Norway Maples in Maynard that we can't run around cutting them down, but we just have to understand that um, they're just, um, they break easily, the branches break. Um, there are problems with some of these, but we've also seen you know, uh, again, the European copper beaches. And there's also a very nice large one uh, right by St. Bridget's Church. That's another place you'll see a beautiful European copper beach. Uh, Catalpa, another uh, softwood introduced species. And there's a little uh, cluster actually of these are actually right next to Maplebrook Park. So you can, and they have these long pods 
with the seeds. So you have to realize that some of these came over early, like the fruit trees were brought over, other were brought over. Catawba was thought it could be used for railroad ties, but that didn't work. Others were garden, garden ornamentals that sort of broke out. Um, uh, so, and here's a point, a survey conducted for Maynard in 2020 reported that 25% of the trees in public spaces are Norway maples. Clearly, there was a tremendous amount of overplanting of this one particular uh, subbreed of maple trees. And we have to try to replace these with more variety. Uh, you also have to remember that at one point, trees were, lined, trees were lined with elm trees. And then when we lost all those, we were losing shade on Elmwood Street, Elm Street, and many other streets as we sort of had, had created a monoculture of one type of tree. And that's always a risk. So we're talking about planting one type of tree. On the left in the black and white, you see Maple Street planted with maple trees circa 1870 when the houses were built. So by 1910, these are nice mature trees. Pretty much every 30 feet or so there was a maple tree. And, and here it is 2019 on the right. Uh, there are only four remaining. Uh, they're definitely sort of aging out, but we still have these 150 year old maple sugar maples on Maple Street. And there's actually behind one of the largest sugar maples in Maynard is in the backyard of number 12 Maple Street, my neighbor. So if you really want to get a peek at a massive sugar maple, you can sort of look down their driveway at number 12 Maple. And it is a very significantly handsome tree. So we now have the tree committee, the tree corps, who are promoting the planting of trees on public and private land. We'll work in developing an ongoing tree census, seek grants, education programs, um, consider proposing a tree by law for privately owned trees. Now, I don't know if you some are aware, but in some places such as California, you are basically prohibited from cutting trees on your own property without getting a permit first, which seems very onerous if you sit and they're looking at it. And of course, a dead tree, a sick tree perhaps, but the point is, the state of California has said, we really wanna protect trees on public and on private land. And the town may wanna to consider the same sort of ruling to try to protect our trees. The photos are from a DW, DPW planting of trees along Mason and Mason, Main Street, May 2021 to replace dozens of trees that had been there and had, had basically all died back. Okay, let's back up for a moment because I just want to add a little bit more uh, high, uh, background to this. So the annual budget for Maynard, from the, the town of Maynard has annually budgeted on the order of $20,000 a year for tree management and tree planting, which is, I'm going to say, a pittance. Grants add to that, which is nice. The town does annually renew its Tree City USA status. Uh, Justin DeMarco, head of DPW also serves as a tree warden, one of the requirements. However, there was a town of Maynard tree resource management plan presented to the town in 2020, which recommended an ideal, I'm gonna put that in quotes, an ideal five-year budget on the order of $250,000 a year, which included planting nearly 400 new trees every year. So between what we're spending and ideally or maximally what we could be sending, there's a very large gap. Um, I'd say that um, privately people should think of planting trees on their own property, especially if they're taking down trees. Uh, there's tremendous benefits uh, from having trees on your property. Um, the downside is yes, you have to rake up leaves in the fall, but still, um, I think that trees are wonderful. And it's pointed out that urban trees research confirms that trees, and these are some things trees do, they increase property values. They decrease the cost of cooling buildings in the summer, especially if planted on the south side. They improve air quality by absorbing pollutants. Uh, trees reduce stormwater runoff, which is an important point. They improve, here it is, this is, they improve the mental status of drivers and pedestrians and homeowners. And they provide for wildlife diversity. So definitely plant a tree. Now, there's a series of stories we're gonna to touch on about gardens. So we had um, World War I victory gardens. Citizens were encouraged 
uh, to grow vegetables that more food could be ex exported to Europe. Uh, during the Great Depression, again, uh, there was land settled site and funded for municipal gardens providing fruits, uh, mostly vegetables, potatoes, beans, and a canning operation. And you can see this, it was huge. And this was in the pittance. So land at, at the mill, land at the gunpowder mills, uh, town land uh, was planted, gardens, and they were bringing in plenty as many 30,000 cans of vegetables produced. The main, and then World War II again, uh, we had a Victory Gardens again popular. There was the first iteration of the Maynard Garden Club, which we'll touch on from 38 to 62, with the object of the club shall be to stimulate the knowledge and love of gardening among amateurs. Uh, and then we now have our Maynard Community Gardeners, um, slightly different uh, intent, uh, devoted to town beautification, promoting the love of gardening and connecting with our other gardeners and the greater Maynard area neighbors. And we have a new project, a revived project, the Honeybee Meadow, 2017 to present. So part of the art space property was converted to a honeybee pollinator friendly garden with a honeybee hive. And you'll find out that's sort of being resurrected and that was a general pollinator garden. Now we do have an effort that actually predates all of this. And some of you may not know that Albert J. Batley started a florist greenhouse wholesale flower business with his greenhouses uh, behind the Fowler Funeral Home circa 1890. Uh, his son, Albert E. Badley, continued the business into the 1950s. Um, so if you look at the pictures, you start with the family quite nicely dressed in, their, um, in one of their greenhouses. They had over 7,000 square feet of space under glass. Uh, on the right, you have their horse-drawn delivery wagon. It was gussied up for um, I think it was a, uh, one of the town parades, so it was full of flowers. The bottom lecture, you've got a, a, a team, a pair of horses drawing a sled. Um, I think that's Mrs. Alfreda Batley driving, her husband taking the picture. And they are at the moment stopped, at, they and their sled on in front of their house that is on Acton Street, which is the same house where that massive European copper beach is. And you see also a close up. Uh, Mrs. Batley in the Green Household and some of the wonderful productions. Um, of a different note, Albert E. Batley and his wife, Elfria, were injured in a horrific train accident in 1905. Uh, nine Maynard residents uh, died. If you haven't heard about this before, uh, the local train started out from North Station and it was heading out of the main track this way and it was supposed to veer off at Acton to come do the deliveries in Maynard. Um, but Behind it, about 40 minutes later, the Montreal Express started out from North Station on the same track. There were some delays on the local. So um, in Lincoln, uh, the Montreal Express plowed almost at full speed into the back of the uh, train, the local train, uh, killing some 17 people, injuring another 25 or 30. And that was the most horrific train accident we we're aware of that involved people in Maynard. So the Maynard Garden Club. Uh, I'm going to, to make a distinction between that garden club and ours, I'm going to say um, the old garden club was white gloves and the new garden club is dirty knees. Uh, but it was, when it was started, it would promote gardening, it's limited initially to 25 members. Uh, they had twice annual judge flower arrangement shows, monthly meetings, speakers, field trips, um, annual plant sale, sounds familiar. And the Maynard Historic Society, has a few photos and also the extensive list of uh, minutes, meetings of the uh, minutes of the meetings. And this is an undated picture of some of the people just from the old garden club. The new garden club, um, so started, established in 1995 as an organization of town beautification. You see the website there. Um, the center picture in the one on the lower right is when the plant sale, the annual plant sale was still on Maple Street and has since moved as noted in the lower left, that it's, it's moved to the Maynard Elks. And I understand will be um, appearing there again um, this May at the Elks parking lot. And one hopes everyone remembers to go there and buy their plants. Um, membership is uh, well over hundred and annual dues are $20. So we know that Maynard Community Gardens maintained Maple Grove Park at the corner of Maple and Summer Street, and also buckets uh, scattered about town. As you can see one of the ones in the lower right, which means planting and then watering 
those buckets, the town, if you look in the far distance of that picture, you'll see a hanging uh, planter and the town hangs those up and waters those, but the, I believe the town manages those, but the ones on the ground are managed by uh, uh, community garden members. So this is from the 15th anniversary of Maine Community Gardens, which was coincided with the plan to create um, Maple Brook Park. So what happened in 1992, and here's just a little bit of history, the town of Maine was considering constructing a small parking lot at the corner of Maple and Summer Streets, and neighbors led by Teresa Jones, who's in the, the, the white uh, and blue outfit on the, on the left, um, and Diane Russo counter-proposed a park the park proposal was approved at town meeting and was a catalyst for starting the Maine Community Gardeners as an organization a few years later. So in 2017, the park lost almost one third of its area to the Aspen River Rail Trail across the back. The trade off being now that far more people see the park every day. Um, 30 buckets were purchased by the town with a grant from Stratus Technologies, and MCG has added more over time. Other base businesses have contributed to the Pindy Gardeners, and these bins uh, provide just a, a bit of added beauty and, and decoration to downtown. I do want to mention that there were some plans for a 25th anniversary, which would have occurred in 2020, but were deferred because of our COVID pandemic. Now, if we talk about the Bee Meadow, uh, as you can see in the upper left, this was basically uh, weedy, grassy, poor soil, sort of dead space behind um, art space, the art space building on Summer Street. Um, so I called it a weedy wasteland. And this became the Honeybee Meadow in 2017, now in the process of being revisioned as the pollinator meadow. Um, the original project was con conceived and led by Denise Shea and, and Melissa Diosa using a combination of crowdsource funding and a matching grant from the state to raise about $15,000, convert this lot um, into a honeybee friendly meadow by bringing in soil, by bringing in plants, by installing uh, benches and decorations and art, and by painting a mural across the back wall. So if you look at the lower left, you'll see there are flowers painted on the lower wall, which is the cement wall. And that was done in, in 2017, then above that, there's a new mural that just went in in 2025, which is uh, canvas on a wooden frame. And the plan here is to try to replant the meadow, which has sort of gone a bit, again, weedy again, with a wide range of pollinator friendly uh, uh, plants and, and just make it just a, one more piece of beautification of Maynard. Okay, let's see what we have next. Ah, okay, one of the most important things that we've learned about gardens in Maynard is that low maintenance does not mean no maintenance. Um, members of the Maynard Community Gardeners commit to maintaining Maplebrook Park and other sites. Uh, the Trail of Flowers members, and we'll hear more about that, and volunteers plant and prune along the Asper River Rail Trail, not just in Maynard, but in other towns. And at the future Marble Farm Park, aided by high school community service volunteers and ART members. Again, continuous maintenance is required to keep these things from going rewilding. Um, maintenance Conservation Commission has made, it's supposed to be past attempts um, and intends to do more looking forward to maintain the town's system of trails and combat invasive plant species such as oriental bittersweet, um, and uh, oh, let's see what else we've got. Uh, Japanese knotweed, uh, Japanese barberry, uh, multiflora rose, garlic mustard. Um, there's always gonna be work. Okay, let's stick with this. I'm not listed here. but point out the Maynard Girl Scouts helped develop and maintain the Coolidge Park Butterfly Garden. Maynard Boy Scouts did initial clearing at the Marble Farm Historic Site soon become Maynard's newest official park. Scouts also worked hard to make sections of the pre-paved rail trail walkable by filling between the rails with wood chips that were donated by Aspet Valley Tree and Landscaping. And lest we forget, the Department of Public Works mows the grass in Maynard's public parks and bordering the rail trail and manages trees throughout the town with DPW Director Justin Marco serving as tree warden. I 
I want to elaborate on climate change because it, it affects what we're growing, what we're planting, what grows wild, how it grows. So here's the point. We have weather records from Massachusetts dating back more than 100 years. And shows there's been a modest increase in temperature and a much larger increase in precipitation. So we've become a little bit warmer and a lot wetter. One of the reasons is that warm air can hold more water. So when warm, wet air collides with cold air, the result is more intense precipitation and flood risk increases. Um, I don't know if you're aware, there's a number of flood control dams up and down the Assabet, but we still, as recently as 2010, had a pretty significant flood that uh, brought the river to more than seven feet uh, deep. Winter has gotten shorter. Um, one example is Lilac Sunday down the Arboretum. It used to be the last Sunday in May. It's now the second Sunday. Winter has gotten snowier. This sort of feels like a contradiction in terms if it's warmer, but what you've got is a shorter, snowier winter. Of the 10 snowiest winters dating to 1890, seven have been in the last 30 years. And as a matter of fact, Boston's January 29th storm tied a record for the most snow in one day. What you've got is you're seeing less snow in December, but you're going to see larger storms in January and February uh, and into March uh, because of that warm air and warm wet air colliding. This shows the numbers. Uh, so you can see the horizontal line is the absolute average in temperature. Your scale on the left shows that your average temperature for Massachusetts was just under, is under 48 degrees. The red line shows the change over time. So we've become about one degree Fahrenheit warmer, which is a modest but still significant amount. It's definitely changed the timing of, of the end of fall and the beginning of spring. Much wetter. Now, over the same time period, the red line is very steep. You've gone from average around 35 to 40 inches of precipitation a year up towards, and some people say above 50. Uh, now, if you notice, I've also pointed out uh, here you have the 1964-66 drought, tremendous drop. But in general, we are be everything east, and it's not just Massachusetts, pretty much as the country as a whole, everything east of the Mississippi River has become wetter. Everything west of the Mississippi has, has become dry, drier. So the problem is, is all throughout New England and really throughout much of the eastern United States. As a consequence, the average volume of water in the Aspen River has increased. So this is, the scale is cubic feet per second. Uh, and you've got an average uh, that has, was under 200 and is now over 200. And you've got some wet years and some dry years. And again, here's your um, 64, 65, 66 drought. Uh, now, of course, the river goes up and down. It's pretty low in the, in, in the summer. But then overall year, the river reflects what's happening with the rain. rain. This also increases because with more population density, we see more paving, we see more parking lots, we see more stormwater runoff into the river. Another reason why I support the plant trees, because trees absorb stormwater and hold it and throw it back into the air rather than having to erode our soil. So now two of my pet projects, uh, Marble Farm, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is a site that is next to Route 27 and the rail trail, pretty much across from Christmas Motors. And it's called Marble Farm because the Marble family settled there in 1705, making them one of the very, very first families um, to move to the area and built a basically a, a two family house and occupied the same family, occupied that house, descendants, sixth and seventh generation for over 200 years until the house burned to the ground in 1924. So we have that same house from 1705 to 1924. They were basically in the horse stable business. They had a couple of hundred acres, of barns, kept horses for people um, and provided uh, wagons for various uses. So. And what you're seeing here is uh, with Peg Brown's help, the Boy Scouts through an Eagle Scout project decided to clear this site uh, with town permission, by the way, to cut down the trees that grown up in the middle of the foundation and the other dead trees and the vines and the growth and clear the area 
and uh, so that you could see the historic site. And they put a post and chain uh, around two sides of this foundation. Um, and this has become, you're gonna see evolving into uh, Maynard's Park. But at the time, part of the problem is everything kept on regrowing. So this picture in the upper left is if nothing's done, there's this sort of dirt causeway coming into it, but everything gets two to three feet tall. It's a combination of sumac, bittersweet, knotweed, grape vines, annuals, just rewilding the space, even though it was cleared like 2011, 2013. So a decision was made in 2018 to clear it and plant grass by throwing down a couple hundred pounds of grass seed in the fall and spring over a couple of years and mowing that to make this a basically a lawn. So what you're now seeing is this is the rail trail in front. Here's the brick bricked causeway going into it. Um, this is the drainage ditch, the fence, a yard, the back fence, and then way back here, you sort of see where the foundation was. Um, there is a plan now. This site has become an idea. Can we make this into official town park? So if you look at the diagram, this is the idea of the house, a little bit of parking, they have been a thought to have a larger parking back here, which was canceled. But instead, you've got this area of about 0.6 acres um, that this year, in the next few months, and here's the plan. So here's the rail trail at the bottom. Um, the existing brick quasi will be replaced by a wooden uh, a deck bridge. The parking will be here. There'll be uh, crushed stone, stone dust paths connecting the parking lot to the rail trail, also the parking lot to the upper area where there'd be a path around the foundation and there'll be a four foot high steel fence all the way around the foundation to prevent people from going into the foundation. And inside the foundation, it will be covered with landscaping cloth that stop plants and filled in with a couple of inches of gravel. So it'll just stay without, main, without much maintenance needed, keeping it visible. Uh, the lawns will be, you know, stay. Uh, there are huge brush piles here and here that we remove but this is the future Marble Farm Historic Site and Park where construction will be starting uh, very soon this year. This is funded by Maynard's um, Community Preservation Committee um, as, as part of Maynard's open space. And it becomes basically a, a welcome to Maynard because people are coming down the rail trail from the north. You've got this beautiful park here and the uh, Trail of Flowers group has planted thousands of daffodils here, mostly lining. Uh, along this, this stone wall right here, and you'll see pictures of that. So this has become a little gem, a highly visible and highly popular visited uh, gem of, of Maynard. So we have a landscape architect who gave us this design and we're ready to go. Now Trail of Flowers uh, was started in the uh, fall of uh, 2018, its purpose to have flowering plants spread out all along the rail trail in all of the towns. The plants are a mix of flowering bulbs, pollinator friendly perennials, plants, shrubs, and trees with a preference for native species. Uh, as of fall 2021, plants have been active in Maynard, Marlboro, Hudson will be added this year. The Maynard sites so are the Marlboro Farm site, um, also between Concord Street and Summer Streets so or behind Cumberland Farms gas station the green space near the bridge over the Aspect River, uh, and also now along High Street. Acton sites, Sylvia Street access, and the trailhead. Um, and we're planting, these are some of the names of things that have been planted over these, this year. So the Aspect River Rail Trail as a 501c3 organization acts as basically the treasurer for this fundraising for Trail of Flowers. It's been a combination of grants, private donations, and sale of only Maynard Bugs. You can see a picture here. Going forward, this will become a membership organization with annual dues, sort of akin to what you're seeing with the Maynard Community Gardeners, uh, but we'll also seek uh, uh, industry and private grants and donations. Uh, so since its origin, Trail of Flowers has raised a bit over $8,000 and spent um, a bit over 6,500. Uh, these mugs are available for $10 at uh, the outdoor store in Boston Bean. And there is a backstory to owner Maynard, but we just don't have the time today uh, to go into that. Now, as part of some of the decoration we've seen at the site, 
I thought, gee, it would be nice to have a giant daffodil sculpture. So here's my basically back of an envelope, literally back of an envelope design of this idea. And then I thought, well, you, you can stick it into a Christmas tree stand. This is a, a basically a post on the top, uh, a bit of plywood cut out, shaped, um, painted yellow. And what we've got now is this daffodil sculpture, which, which shows up at, at the Marble Farm site when the daffodils bloom, stays there for about a month, and then goes back into my barn. Here are our volunteers. So here you see this large group that they're planting in the first year with our daffodil, another planting group. And we also have this sign that shows up to remind people what this is, the trail of flowers. Another volunteer group planting along those stones right by the entrance to the footbridge. Uh, and then this is the Maynard High School group, uh, uh, high school students planting along High Street, hundreds of daffodils. So this has become a continuing annual effort. We're planting as I said, uh, trees, shrubs, uh, and we'll continue to plant bulbs, but try to have more bias towards pollinator friendly types of things. For example, some of the things we've accomplished. Uh, this is a patch of grape hyacinth planted by Marlboro Girl Scouts. Uh, here's the daffodils in bloom and a close up of the daffodils with the tulips behind, um, also at the Marble Farm site. Some of you may be familiar with tulip corners. What you've got in the background here is, is the end of the Maple Brook Park, but then across the street, you have this little triangle uh, framed by stone, which at one point was planted daffodils in these colored tulips. And then there's some tall grass here and this uh, butterfly bush. But these died out and replaced by um, all yellow tulips, which are still planted there and still coming up. Now I say all yellow, but you notice Amongst those, there is this one red tulip. And here's the story, that was deliberate. That was not by accident. I decided we needed one red tulip, but the first year as it was coming up and just it was starting to color up, someone was so offended by the fact that there was a red tulip, they just snipped the top of it off. And then the next year, again, as that one red tulip was starting to color up, I, perhaps the same person was still so offended that they snipped the top of it off. Now, either they gave up where they moved away. So now, if you do visit that site, you'll see the yellow tulips and uh, one or two red tulips uh, in amongst them. But I just thought it was interesting that, that, that someone's compulsiveness was just so offended by the one red tulip that they felt that they had to come out. Um, there are also volunteer plants. And this is one of the nice things is you've got this whole patch of black-eyed Susans that are along the rail trail uh, parallel to Railroad Street. You've got this patch of, yes, it's Japanese nightweed, but one of the things I've noticed is it's late blooming and the honeybees like it. It is a monoculture, I don't promote it, but I'm not as offended by it as it was before and I realized honeybees like it. Um, chicory with these little blue flowers, uh, a big patch of goldenrod along the trail. So we definitely got some volunteers. We're also planting more goldenrod along the trail because that's loved by wasps. And again, it's a, it's a late season blooming plant. I think I've reached the end. Um, okay, thank you for caring about Maynard's trees and gardens. If you've never seen it, this pair of spruce trees is, dominates this poor little house on um, Glendale Street, sort of uh, east of the library. So it's worth just to walk down there and say, I bet when they planted them, they didn't think they were gonna get that big. And then we've got a, a peony, a rose, a Siberian iris, and then these flamingos sort of wandered through our garden. If you visit our yard, they come out of the barn in the spring, they circumnavigate the backyard and sort of just get back into the barn just before the first frost in September. So I think that's our talk. Um, we're gonna do that. Stop the share, go back to people. And Sally, if you will uh, moderate, I see we have some chat questions and maybe some other questions. And well, let's let's talk. Okay. Um, so Aaron's gonna <clears throat> Aaron's gonna jump in. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> excuse me. Kate mentions that there's a another club, the nonprofit Maynard Tree Corps, um, with a link for people to check out. Kate, do you want to talk about the Tree Corps for a second? Do you want to unmute? Um, I, I think a lot of people here are aware of it already. Um, it's, it's the alter ego of the tree committee. It's, it's the, n n the civilian part, <laughs> you know, that supports trees. 
And, and we have a few other things to, to, to talk about real quick, just in terms of, um, you know, just letting anybody who's here today, um, let them know that these things exist. Uh, while we talk about these things, I wanna encourage anybody here to put your, any questions that you have in the chat. Um, I know I have lots of questions. So uh, yeah, just like, like a lot of things to talk about. Um, so please put those in the chat. In the interim, I just wanted to say, um, I really appreciate, David, I really appreciate your call to action in terms of um, homeowners, home gardeners, nurturing trees in their own yards. I wanted to use this as a plug uh, for um, Neil Peterson, who is a Maine resident and also a forest ecologist. Uh, he is going to be leading a, you know, tour slash talk um, on April 9th at 9 a.m. Um, talking about you know, somewhat giving a, just a tour of the, the downtown Arboretum in Maynard, but also um, saying a word or two of advice for home gardeners in terms of which trees might be most helpful to nurture and then how you might best nurture those types of trees. So um, yeah, I, I really appreciate that call to action. So there will be details forthcoming in terms of that talk. Um, also, uh, David, you mentioned the plant sale of days past. I wanted to take just a moment and invite uh, Marianne Shainer, Shiner, Shainer, um, Shiner. to <laughs> just say a word about um, the plant sale coming up this year. Thank you, Erin. David, thank you. This was fascinating and I learned so much and I really appreciate hearing all this stuff. Um, real quick plug. We had a little pause for COVID, but we came back last year with the 26th annual Maynard plant sale at the Elks and it was wonderful. And we're hoping to do such wondrous things again. It will be Saturday, May 14th from 9 a.m. to noon at the Elks parking lot. Um, we're looking forward to having lots of wonderful volunteers, hint, hint, uh, as well as people coming to browse. Um, if you don't know about the plant sale, most of the plants are donated from local gardens. And that means they've already proven they can live here, which is a, a nice advantage. We also have uh, annuals, annual flowering plants and herbs and vegetables and beautiful hanging baskets from Brigham's who graciously partner with us uh, to provide those. And if you have questions, you can uh, certainly look at the information that's being posted on the Maynard Community Gardeners website and Facebook page and uh, in the newspapers. Or if you have questions or please, please, please would like to volunteer, you can contact me and my email for this is strout. S T R O U T 1896 at gmail.com. Right. And Marianne, maybe um, are you willing to like put that in the chat as well, your email address? Sure. You don't have to, of course, but <laughs> if you want to. <laughs> no, this is my this is my plant sale email. And I don't know, David may may uh, notice that name because Strout was uh, a historical family in Maynard, and that's why I picked it. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, we have uh, one more quick plug uh, before we get to the Q&A proper. Uh, Lee, you had posted a comment during David's talk about um, a bylaw, uh, I guess I assume in terms of tree planning, but maybe not, um, a bylaw proposed by the tree committee, which is coming up for a vote in the fall. Do you want to take a moment to say a little bit about that? Good. Oh, uh, Lee, you're mute. Lee, let, okay, hold on one second. Let me. I'm unmute. Okay, there we go. Okay, um, Maynard has had a tree committee for about one year now. Uh, it's a so-called ad hoc committee appointed by the town administrator, not the select board. Um, and uh, we have um, worked very hard uh, with the tree core to uh, have the plantings done on Nason and Main Street. 
uh, the waterings. I put in the chat that that uh, really the the town budget for trees, the twenty thousand that David referenced, is almost entirely for removal and some planting. Uh, not planting, some pruning. There is zero money in town um, in the town budget for planting trees. And so the, for example, the trees that were planted on Nason and Main came uh, as mitigation funds when the pot shops, uh, one on Nason and one on Main, um, were applying for their special permits to be able to have their businesses there, funding uh, was um, requested for trees. And so that is the source of the new trees um, in the area. And we tried there to um, use um, exclusively native trees. Uh, there's one ginkgo uh, that was uh, a request of a, of a shop owner. Uh, that is not native, that's Asian, um, but the rest are a variety of native trees and they are the beginning of what uh, we hope will be a more uh, ex expansive so-called urban arboretum. In other words, not uh, a set location uh, like the Arboretum in Acton or the Arnold Arboretum. Um, the committee, is in the process of developing a bylaw for trees. This is something the town needs. It's something many towns have. And we've uh, been working um, to develop our own. Um, we had suggestions from our new conservation agent about several bylaws in other towns that she thought were quite successful. And we also have tried to think about how the town of Maynard works and what the town of Maynard needs. And it's in a very preliminary stage. And um, so uh, we're going to be um, showing it to a variety of, of people for input. And there's a whole process, um, as you may know, to actually uh, get a bylaw ready to go to town meeting. There is a, a charter and bylaw committee in town. There's the uh, legal council, et cetera. But it's coming, people. And we are so excited um, and, that it is coming. And Lee, is it possible for you to put into the chat just um, any kind of link or email address if people are more interested in um, how they can support this bylaw? Well, the, the, the draft bylaw is not available yet for public consumption, sure. but um, the, the, the um, web page uh, the uh, on the town website, townamater-mass.gov, uh, has the tree committee uh, there, and you can see um, what the mission of the committee is, who, who the people on the committee are, and there are references to the tree core. There That's are right. references um, to a variety of things, uh, to the, uh, the uh, actually the um, uh, management plan that, that David talked about is not on the tree committee site. It's um, uh, through uh, DPW. Um, I think uh, through the cemetery division, um, but um, it, it, it is there if you hunt around. And right. I, I and, really and if, don't want to take all your time. <laughs> sure, if you're willing, if you want to put whatever URL you just said, if you want to put that in the drop that in the chat, that's great. If not, no worries. Um, I'm sure we'll be hearing more about that as uh, the project progresses. Um, one thing I wanted to address real quick, um, so uh, Demetra, I think um, I'm saying that right. I had a question about like whether peach like like asking peach trees are invasive. I'll just say real quick. Um, I think David, from your uh, slide, you were indicating which trees were introduced, and some of them were labeled as invasive. Are you willing? Are you able to put that slide back up? Just so we can see, because uh, right. you had a list of trees or, or plants that were okay, introduced, of which the trees were one. Okay, so we're back to the beginning. <laughs> and um, slideshow. 
a little bit stuck right now. Hang on. Sure. Okay, so da 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 da. da. There. There we go. Yeah. Okay, so the ones with stars are considered invasive in Massachusetts. Yeah. Thank there you. We go. Because I was like, peach trees. What? Thanks for helping <laughs> me understand that. Okay. All right. So, you know, and there's some tree of heaven right behind uh, John's dry cleaners. Uh, right. Uh, there's a couple of tree of heaven there. There aren't that many large tree of heaven around, but there's a couple also along the rail trail um, parallel of the high street. So we've got a bit of that. Um, we, I haven't seen, um, yeah, black locust, definitely Norway maple and Nor uh, are, are around, but uh, some of these we don't have, but they are considered invasive. So, all right, I'll, I'll get out of this one. Okay. So in terms of also speaking on um, native versus introduced, uh, one question Robert and Anna ask, um, is there some thought to putting primarily native trees and shrubs on the bike path? For example, uh, okay. a word that I don't know how to pronounce, Fothergillus, viburnum, native smoke tree. Wait a minute, how do I say that? <laughs> Fother. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll get we'll back to them, but the point is, um, initially we've started out mostly with what I'm gonna call eye candy, uh, daffodils and tulips and grape hyacinth. Um, last year, we definitely started branching out to things that are pollinator friendly like beauty bush, which also hummingbirds love. Uh, we have some um, uh, forsythia uh, and we'll be buying more uh, and planting more native plants, uh, but I'm still wanting to make sure that we have uh, a continuation of what I call, you know, eye candy along the trail. Um, and one of the reasons we're choosing daffodils is the deer won't eat them, but they do eat tulips, uh, for example, but, but they're, they're, you know, I think we can have a good mix. What I've talked to in all the towns is they said, as long as we can stay more than four or five feet away from the actual pavement, because that's the part they're gonna mow on either side of the pavement and let them know what's being planted, uh, they're gonna say give sort of free reign, but uh, the, the garden clubs are the ones that have come back to me and said, well, you know, if we're gonna plant, let's try to make sure we're planting things that are full season, you know, not stacked just earlier acting, but full season pollinator friendly, which is one of the reasons I like, as I said, goldenrod, because that's a, a late in the season pollinator friendly plant. All right, so other questions? Yeah, there, there's one I think is really interesting. Um, uh, this is from a, a, a private message, but uh, it's a question about um, it, the, the, I think the really remarkable fact that at one point the moth department budget was greater than the police department budget. Um, the question is, is this a matter of, do you think, I guess this is an opinion question, do you think that this is about um, the sort of like, this speaks to the severity of the problem or sort of, then again, it, this is not something that you can know, it's only something that you can speculate on, but like whether it's a matter of, we were, whether, do you think we were better in the past at mobilizing on ecological issues? Because I think it's interesting that you would have, you'd be like, there's an ecological threat. The budget for that is now greater than the fire or police department. Okay. Department. The answer okay. is, is when invasive species first show up, they are extremely successful. And uh, then they sort of become tempered over time as their parasites and diseases also show up. Uh, or things start to adapt to eat them. So I don't know if any remember from childhood, there were times you had tremendous bursts of tent caterpillars, you know, and, uh, and, and you don't see that much anymore. And, and you know, trust me, when the gypsy moths first got here, they were eating everything green. I mean, everything, everything. Uh, and then on top of that, you had the brown tail moths. Uh, both of those were sort of uh, oak and maple favoring. And, and, and plus you thought that throwing the fact that the brown tail moths are poisonous, you really wanted to get rid of moths. Uh, people were trying so many different things. And then recently, the, the winter moths were horrifically a bad problem. My, I mean, my birch tree and my maple trees were just denuded and had to put an entirely new set of leaves out at some cost uh, because the winter moths were so prolific. And I remember having my, mm -hmm. my front porch light on and coming home and seeing like 200 males sort of gathered around my front door because the light was on. And I'm thinking, I don't like this at all. 
And if you saw the picture I showed where the females are climbing up the tree and in just humongous numbers. So the point is any invasive species when it first shows up is vigorous. And there's a tempering over time as specific or non-specific diseases and predators start to deal with. I think the spirit of the question is though that like do we do is there an example of, of present day a kind of mobilization that is equal to that? Right? It's hard to imagine. I think the reason that fact that you said is so funny or so interesting is that it's hard for at least me okay, to if, if imagine up, if uh, that up, budget being greater than the police if, budget. Okay. If you look right now, if you look up Maine and Brown Tail Moth, you're gonna see millions of dollars being spent because the brown tail moth is, is decimating the tourist industry. I mean, who wants to go up there and go out and see nature and come home covered in a rash, <laughs> as, as Jane and some of our others have had from our, our, our visits to Maine. Um, and, and so, yeah, right, right now you say Maine and brown tail moth, they say, yeah, <laughs> if it's a threat, you're going to spend money to try to combat it. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, another, so um, Lisa, Lisa Heffley um, mm -hmm. was hoping to say a little word about the pollinator meadow. Lisa, Hi. did you want to? Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah, um, it, it had actually been, that land had actually been uh, a gymnasium. And when that was raised, it, we, uh, it was empty for a while. Now it was, we, turned it into a honeybee meadow with a honeybee hive. And uh, just last year, we've really reworking and, and shifting to serving and supporting po native pollinators. And some of those pollinators are de decreasing tremendously in our area. And we're work working very closely with Dr. Jagir in, um, in supporting and uh, educating uh, folks on how to support our native pollinators uh, system. It's a system. And um, the meadow is actually not full of weeds. Um, it's intended to be wild. And uh, we're working on taking over the upper part of the meadow. And that had been um, numbers of different invasives. And uh, we cleared that land with the Boy Scouts Eagle Project, um, as well as a lot of my time and labor with a few volunteers uh, to get that cleared and covered, actually, for the next steps. But, um, but keep an eye on what we're doing there and um, do take a, a, a tour through. Uh, we've got folks uh, documenting the insects that are visiting in that land and, and on those uh, flowers and, and trees. Um, in, they're documenting it in iNaturalist, the app. And uh, we've got actually a great record of the insects that, that come and frequent uh, the meadow. And um, yeah, so keep, do keep an eye. And if you want to learn more about our native pollinators and plants that support um, these pollinators, uh, do reach out and get in touch with us. Uh, and Lisa, Lisa, are you willing to put your um, the, the website or email address into the chat for anybody who, who would like to help out with the pollinator meadow? Yeah, it's, it, it can be found on the ArtSpace website. We have a, a link to the, the meadow. All right, great. Um, so David, there was another uh, question. Um, you had mentioned, you know, you're sort of celebrating, I think the reforestation that happened when people were like, I'm sick of, I'm sick of New England. I'm gonna find an easier place to farm. Um, what is your stance on, um, if we imagine Maynard as it is now, right? Um, what is your stance on rewilding in terms of encouraging people to take land that they own and letting it do what it wants to do? I think it comes down to low maintenance versus no maintenance. So what I'd, I'd suggest is 
shrink the lawn, widen the garden beds, plant right. consciously in what's in the garden beds if you still need something of a lawn. I mean, our, our, our lawn has been gotten you know, definitely smaller over time. Our garden beds are six to eight feet wide. Um, we're trying to maintain variety, but sometimes some plants sort of start dominating and you try to mix them up or plant things that disappeared. I, I don't think you can just, wild, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a progression or a succession of plants, That's right. um, but sometimes it's dominated by plants that aren't necessarily ones you want. So as I said, you end in disturbed territory, you end up with a lot of garlic mustard, um, bittersweet and poison ivy. So <laughs> uh, Japanese barberry. I, to, for example, if people have walked on the Ashford River Walk Trail, the people, the people are aware where that is, there's two entrances. One is on Concord Street and the other is Colbert Avenue, the end of Colbert Avenue. If you come in from Concord Street and there's a sign there, it says Ashford River Walk and it's, it's, and you walk in and you're looking at what you're looking at, you're seeing tremendous amounts of Japanese barberry, yeah. burning bush, yeah. um, garlic mustard, right. multi-floor rose, uh, oriental bittersweet. If you come in from the other end, from Colbert Avenue, you got a huge patch of Japanese knotweed. This actually was once upon a time cow pasture. And yes, it's, it's reforested, but the invasives have gotten a hold on a lot of it. So a lot of the under, understructure is Japanese barberry. Um, so I, I think, again, um, it can't just be let things go wild and, and see what happens. It's, it's, it's going to take work. But shrink the lawn. The lawn is the lawn is a desert. The lawn is is a, uh, a variety desert. Absolutely, and and probably more consumptive of um, natural resources in terms of like water, for example. Um, yeah, and, than, and also what well, chemicals? I mean, a chemical, and also it 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 does less in holding back stormwater. It doesn't absorb as much stormwater as as. Uh, uh, you know, a, a mixed plant mix. Um, and do you have any resources that you can suggest in terms of like recognizing if you're if you're looking to rewild your property, mm -hmm. do you have any resources that you can suggest in terms of identifying what might be um, something that you would want in your ecosystem, in your local eco ecosystem for what you I, want? I think there are better lists and better experts. I'm more of a historian than I am a, a trained car. I can walk in my backyard and tell you what's pretty, but I can't always tell you what his <laughs> name is. So I, I'm gonna to defer to people who have access to, you know, people who are, who, who by profession are really understanding, you know, what's growing here and uh, what we want growing here. And, and I think, again, Lisa has the, the, the connections that, that they're working on through the, uh, the pollinator menu. Uh, meta. You also want things that are bird friendly. Uh, we've been planting winterberry along the rail trail because cedar waxwings and ramens uh, eat those berries when they come through in the winter and spring. Uh, so, so you have to also start thinking about not just pollinator friendly, but you want to make places where birds can nest, where birds can find food. And, and that's another group that we, you know, we, we otherwise will lose. We'll lose our birds if we don't pay attention to what's you know, bird friendly. Yeah, great. And we're getting a lot of uh, suggestions in the um, in the chat in terms yeah. of resources for checking that out. Yes. Yeah. Um, Demetra's raised her hand. I think um, this sounds like a lot might what you might be talking about in two weeks, Demetra. Do you want to unmute? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, I actually just threw some things into the chat, but it's a great question about rewilding. And David, I I haven't met you. I think you're fabulous. And I agree with you. If you just leave it alone, all hell is going to break loose because invasives are invasive. Yeah. But um, I will talk about that and I'll have resources too, but like Grow Native out of Waltham is a great organization and anything Doug Tallamy writes is great. And, you know, Garden in the Woods is great. So, but yeah, and Russell's has a native plant section now. Yes, yes. Oh yeah, there are lots of great places to get native plants now. The species, it's great. Yeah, right. So Demetra's talk is um, in two weeks on the 31st. And I'll put that link in the chat again. Okay, good, good. Other questions either about the history of this? Because um, you have to realize that, that, you know, the woods we see are not the woods that were, they were here 200, 300 years ago. So, so uh, and, on that, there is another question that I got privately, which was about um, 
um, indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. So um, the question is basically like, do you have, you know, in your research, did you come across anything that had anything to do with um, the use of the land done by indigenous peoples? basically, like referencing also the work done by Friends of Pinehawk in Acton, right? The, the, um, the, the sort of like conservatorship that is happening there. Well, actually one of the talks I gave last year was called Before the Europeans Got Here and After. And I was actually able to consult with uh, Nipmuc, which was the local indigenous people to talk about uh, what their lives and, and culture was like before the Europeans got here. So one of the points that was made was they pretty much didn't live in Maynard. Maynard was bad land for, for an indigenous people also. It was too hilly. What you wanted were um, rivers that had floodplains like the Sudbury and Concord, uh, where, uh, and also which had fish year round. Uh, the Aspit did not. The Aspit was sort of a, a fast, slow river in the spring. It was high and floody. And then by summer, it was a trickle. So it didn't really support a fish population. Uh, it definitely wasn't farm friendly at all for the Native Americans. Um, so you, you have to understand that, that the Native Americans lived at a low density in, in away from the shore. Uh, all, the, all the groups along the shore um, had a, a higher food source, the ocean, and had a higher population density. The Nimuk, which pretty much occupied, it's called the center third, what we now call Massachusetts and part of Northern Connecticut, Rhode Island, numbered only about 10,000 people for that whole large area because you know they're looking at freshwater fish and freshwater mussels, um, uh, hunting deer in season and beaver, but it all comes down to is is uh, some of this, a lot of this land wasn't farm friendly or farming friendly. Uh, they did have again corn, beans, squash, um, fishing, hunting, but but uh, it was a lower population density, um, moving around seasonally to where the food was. So you weren't in a place um, and. Well, year round, you, you, the, the groups moved around to where the food was at the time of the year it was there. I hope that gives a bit of a picture, uh, but that talk is on the library website. Excellent, yeah, thank you so much. And, I, I, and it looks like Sally has actually posted a, a link to those talks um, in the chat. So that's very helpful. Um, another question, um, the, the previous Maynard Community Gardens that you mentioned, um, where, like geographically, like within Maynard, like geographically, like where were those centered? Do you have information on that? Well, remember they didn't have any public space gardening at all. There, there was no, there was no equivalent. This group was not planting gardens in public space or managing garden in public space. They were having meetings at each other's houses. Uh, they were having, say, a a flower arrangement. Uh, almost competitions twice a year. They were maybe going to visit gardens um, or garden in the woods even, but it, it wasn't the same sort of club that or that towns have now, that towns see the function of a garden club as being part of the community, the public community. It was a different function. It was, I definitely gonna call upper middle-class white um, families, uh, were just because they, they like flowers and like gardens, but um, and uh, but it's it's not what we think of now. That was interesting. I, when you were reading the um, mission statements, it was mm -hmm. interesting that the original Maynard Garden Club, like their mission statement, was specifically about promoting love of gardeners for amateurs. Um, Do you, the, which which seems it seems very particular to me. Do you? Uh, like, do you do you know if that was part of a larger cultural movement, right? Like well, to, to, to found a club with specifically with the desire, the purpose to promote a love within an amateur yes. level. 
Uh, and actually, they, they, I think at the, you look through the town minutes, the Historic Society has the collection uh, in books of the minutes of the, of the, the club. And there are their annual brochures and their schedules. So there's a huge history resource there to get a sense of what they were doing. Uh, so it was, and, and also they, um, they were a little bit taken aback by, let's call it some of the wealthier towns. We had people who had professional gardeners basically managing the gardens for them. So they, they saw themselves as, as, you know, smaller or less than or more modest than that. But it was, and it was, and they had speakers coming in for groups, but I think the one thing they were not doing was maintaining a, a, a public space. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Um, so it looks like we're, we had some excellent questions. Um, yeah, so much okay, excellent anyone, information. Anyone raise a hand or we start running out. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, if there are any other questions, let us know. But it sounds like, um, yeah, this was just a, a wonderful um, survey. Package, yeah, a certain package of information. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I'm going to hand it back over to Sally. But before I do that, um, David, thank you so much for being here and doing this. Um, thank you so much to uh, everyone who's here and who's interested in nature and gardening in Maine. Um, yeah, right, okay. <laughs> there is one question there that we didn't get to. Is it says, do we know where the previous community gardens you mentioned were in town? Well, when we talk about the Victory Gardens or the Depression Garden, it was pretty much where the, the parking lots for the mill are, because you have to realize that well into the 1950s, the mill, which had all those buildings and a million square feet of space, had no parking lots at all. Right. So a lot of like where the fire station is now being put in, that whole upper parking lot was, was turned over for public gardens. And there was also a huge stretch over um, on Powder Mill Road uh, that uh, uh, that was also turned over to uh, you know, public gardens. So so there were areas, but it's, it's odd to imagine that you had a couple of thousand people working in the mill and all of them were walking to work. That was the situation at the time. All right, so I think that, that unless there's any other questions, I'm gonna say it was a joy preparing this. I learned more myself, which was great. <laughs> and I'm glad I could share it. Um, yeah, yeah I learned thank, so much, thank you. Thank you, David. And uh, we hope to see everyone on the Trail of Flowers soon and also um, at the library talk on the 31st and the, the plant sale. And, uh, and don't forget to sign up for the haiku workshop and uh, nature walk on okay. April 2nd. All right, the daffodils right now are, are this big. They're just breaking <laughs> soon. the surface. So. Soon. <laughs> Soon, soon. Okay. All right. Thank you, David. Good night, everyone. All right. Thank you.